my title from the original one that's written, but um, there's going to be a selection of uh, ant-related work uh, that I've uh, worked on over the last, um, I guess, uh, eight years, actually. Um, and so let me start off with uh, just thanking the folks who've helped me with a lot of this work. Um, so uh, I've been at UC San Diego for about three years now. Um, a good portion of this talk is going to be related to work that my postdoc, Glennon Clifton, has been doing there. Um, and this is uh, in collaboration with an ecologist at UC San Diego, David Hallway. Um, can everybody hear me OK, by the way? It's not too loud. Good. Um, some of the work at the end, uh, where I'll talk about some of the robotic stuff that we do in my lab, is done by a PhD student, uh, Ming Sun Zhang. Um, and some of the work at the, the beginning of this talk, um, I did during my PhD work with Dan Goldman, who I guess will be here later today. Um, so let me just go over a brief outline. Um, you know, I want to kind of go through um, all the things that fascinate me about uh, ants, in particular, uh, the way that they uh, move individually, the way that they move collectively, the way that they construct underground environments. Um, and I want to address some issues related to um, subterranean locomotion, particularly how these environments are constructed, um, how ants move through them uh, individually, how they move through them collectively. Um, I want to move to, excuse me. Um, then talking about uh, uh, sort of overground locomotion, so how ants forage uh, uh, walking across rough substrates, um, in particular looking at the aspects of how substrate complexity and roughness uh, affect locomotion. Um, and then at the end, since we do have uh, robotics in the title of this uh, workshop, um, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the work that I do um, trying to create sort of insect-inspired robots. Um, uh, one aspect of that is how do, how do we miniaturize robots down to the scales of insects themselves. Um, another aspect is how do we take principles of uh, the insect exoskeleton and sort of body design um, and embed that in larger scale robots um, themselves. And so, you know, fundamentally, I'm I'm really, I'm, I'm in love with ants. Um, I've worked with ants for over 10 years now. Um, I think they're such a fascinating um, uh, species. They uh, exhibit beautiful collective behaviors, um, uh, wonderful examples of um, highly capable locomotion in incredibly small uh, packages. Um, and I think in particular, what fascinates me the most is that they live in an um, incredibly complex natural world. Um, so the world to an ant um, is, is potentially far more complex than the world of a large-scale vertebrate. And this is a concept that was originally proposed by um, Kaspari and Wieser um, in a, a sort of um, hypothesis, the size grain hypothesis, that you know, if you look at the savanna and you look at the animals that live there, um, larger-scale animals like elephants basically see a nice flat world that they get to move around uh, relatively freely. Um, an animal such as a mouse or something like that might see a slightly more complicated world uh, with uh, some brush that it has to contend with. Um, but the animals that are really living um, at the sort of millimeter scale um, see a, a very complicated, um, you know, kind of quote unquote fractal world uh, that they have to contend with. They have to move through uh, to forage to get from point A to point B. Um, and so I think that locomotion at these, these scales, a sort of millimeter, centimeter scale of uh, insects is really fascinating, um, presents incredibly complex motor challenges for them uh, to, to sort of successfully live in these uh, environments. Um, but they also have the capabilities of manipulating the environment themselves, uh, which also presents fascinating opportunities for um, uh, optimizing locomotion or, or making sort of locomotion uh, effective for their own body types. Um, Ants are, are fantastic as well to um, study because there's huge morphological diversity uh, among the ant species. So if you look at uh, the sort of shape variation uh, that we see across ant species, um, this is an example of two um, ants. Uh, and I do not remember the species names, but um, this is a, the largest of the ant that uh, uh, Kaspari and Wieser were uh, originally looking at for their size grain hypothesis. Um, this is the smaller um, species. This drawing right here is a comparison. This is the, the body size of the smaller species compared to the larger species of ant here. Um, and in a more recent paper um, that was on the cover of JB, uh, you can see this more vividly. This is um, looking at uh, the, comparing the, the sort of um, vision capacities of uh, ants across size, um, and this is basically comparing the smallest of the ant uh, that was in, uh, uh, studied in that study of uh, uh, visual size um, sitting on top of the, um, uh, on top of the eye of uh, a larger species of ant. So you know, we see huge um, size variation among uh, ant species. We can even see uh, really large size variation within individual species within a colony of, of ants, um, huge morphological variation just among uh, different casts of ants. Um, and you know, not just in size, but in limb shape and limb um, uh, design and head shape and, and all sorts of different uh, morphological features. So I think ants present a, a wonderful opportunity to look at um, how sort of morphology compares to um, uh, locomotion function and behavioral function 
um, and we can look at these questions uh, very specifically uh, within species and across species. And so, you know, in this first part of the talk, I want to talk a bit about um, subtraining locomotion. Um, so, many ant species live below the surface. They construct subterranean nests. Um, they do this by uh, inter interacting with the soil, uh, using their mandibles to manipulate soil particles, carry them up to the surface, deposit them at the surface. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite videos is this right here. I didn't take it, unfortunately, but um, I'm well familiar with it. This is uh, a fire ant nest, and what it looks like when you're, you know, maybe living in Georgia and you go out uh, and they're fire ant nests basically every 20 feet around you um, out in a, a nice cleared field. Uh, you take a shovel, you crack into the surface of it, and you basically get a spewing out of hundreds of thousands of these little fire ants. Um, fire ants are about three millimeters in body size. They live in huge colonies, so um, tens to hundreds of thousands. Um, a fire ant nest, uh, a casting of a nest by uh, the biologist Walter Chinkle, looks something like this, um, so maybe a meter below the surface. Um, so you have huge populations living in these subterranean nests. Um, they go basically, uh, the tunnels go down vertically. As well as going down, they also go horizontally. Um, and so this is a, uh, a mapping of the foraging tunnels of two of these uh, colonies, two such colonies of uh, uh, the fire ant. Um, and let me see my scale bar here is, I believe, this is a 10 meter scale bar here. I believe the sort of total length of, uh, of tunnels can exceed 50 meters in length. And again, these are about three millimeter um, uh, individuals. So they create these huge foraging highways. Um, these are fire ants, yes, did I not say that? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, the first part of this talk is gonna deal with fire ants. Um, and again, this is work I was doing in, um, at Georgia Tech. So uh, it, they're very easy to species to work with out there. Again, you step outside your door and you're immediately um, accidentally stepping into a fire ant uh, uh, nest. Um, so, you know, I just think these, uh, these forging tunnels are fantastic um, and, uh, you know, they create these huge subterranean environments, um, and so we were interested in, um, you know, basically all facets of this this um, process. How do you create these environments? Um, who within the colony is digging um, or performing digging tasks within the uh, um, uh, within a fire ant colony? Um, this is a particularly interesting question of this: who is digging? Because if you look at the variation of the size of individuals within a fire ant colony, so this is a, um, a sort of visual demonstration of the variation of body size within uh, Solenopsis, Solenopsis Invicta. And what you see is that from the worker um, cast, which is basically the only cast within a, a fire ant colony, um, there's about a threefold variation in the largest, or from the largest to the smallest individual. Um, and so one of the original hypotheses um, was that this, this size variation um, may lead to uh, functional variation. So large workers may um, you know, defend the nest more, um, more uh, prevalently than smaller workers. They may perform more mechanical um, tasks such as digging or, um, or uh, you know, uh, uh, carrying away um, heavy preloads. Um, so we tested this by isolating individuals, larger individuals and smaller individuals from uh, fire ant colonies. Um, and we basically challenged them to um, construct new tunnels within a, um, a freshly uh, wetted um, sort of monodisperse soil um, sample quasi 2D um, ant tunnel, um, uh, just like you would have as a kid. Um, so we did this in a large capacity where we uh, measured uh, eight tunnels at a time, sorry, eight farms at a time. Uh, we let this run for three days. We measured the final uh, tunnel uh, constructed area, so cross-sectional area, just as a proxy for how much um, total volume was excavated. Um, and what we found was that basically, if you look at, across the small um, uh, cohort, the large cohort, and a control group, which was just uh, the natural population, uh, there's no effective difference between the amount of excavated soil over three days, um, independent of um, you know the fact that uh, the or, irrespective of the fact that across the small and large um, uh, cohorts, there's about a threefold uh, difference in body size. Um, so threefold difference in body length too, so just in terms of uh, length scale, not in terms of uh, volume and sort of muscle capacity and things like that. Um, so, you know, that's one surprising aspect of um, at least working with fire ants uh, is that across this, this continuous gradation of, of body size, uh, there seems to be no specialization for digging tasks. Everybody seems to uh, perform digging tasks. Um, at this Correct, yes, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yes. So is this an impression or is it that they are borrowing uh, most fatal homogeneity of so that's a good question. So you're, you're sort of highlighting this down here, is that right? Yeah, I know, I, I, you stare at this video a billion times and you see that um, 
they tend to follow the more saturated region down here. Yes. Um, so, you know, the, we looked at later on um, specifically how soil cohesion and sort of wetness properties affect digging, and there's a sweet spot in there um, in that you need to have um, some moisture present so that it stabilizes the, the grains. Uh, too much becomes problematic in terms of forming the pellets that they carry to the surface. Um, specifically, you know, the kind of inhomogeneities that we see down here, um, you know, they're sort of um, frustrating in the sense that they do seem to affect the, the speed at which they, they dig here. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, beyond that, I, I can't say anything more. Um, I, I do think that they tend to follow sort of specific radiation gradients of uh, um, water. Um, is there any other questions? Yeah. Have you measured the excavation rate? We did. Um, you're asking with respect to uh, the, the gradients and whether they're following the gradients of speeding up or? As they move farther away from the surface, it should take them longer to move the grains. Indeed, it does. It does, and you know, you see basically a sewing down. It could be um, a square root of t type um, uh, type behavior. Um, you know, if, if a number of these, there was a a, you know, I'm kind of speaking anecdotally now, but. Um, there is definitely a slowing down. So, you know, the slope is less than, um, or the slope is um, getting smaller. But you see in interesting um, sort of behavioral bursts. So you'll see it slow down and then it'll pick up again and then slow down. Um, I, I can't, I, I don't know why those particularly happened. Um, we did individual experiments where you force them to dig a single tunnel. So you basically just make, put grains in a tunnel. Um, and that you do see a, you know, a slowing down. It's a process of having to walk an infinitesimally further distance as you, um, as you go to pick up the next parcel. Um, so that's, it's well described by basically a constant velocity walking model where you're picking up individual grains and you're growing your tunnel by that process. Um, so next we looked at, uh, you know, more specifically how individuals are um, uh, interacting with the tunnel face and how they're uh, transporting grains. Um, and uh, this is work that I collaborated with a, a postdoc on um, uh, at Georgia Tech, kind of um, trying to map out the different specific behaviors that we see uh, in terms of leg bracing, what uh, limbs are being used to manipulate the grain um, uh, surface. You know, interestingly, and we'll see this again pop up, um, uh, they, they use their antennae for uh, formation of, uh, of grains. So Sometimes, so you know, antennae are not just these um, sort of uh, uh, sensory appendages. Um, they they do seem to have purposes um, in a sort of more mechanical task. And again, we'll see that in a, um, in a different context a little bit later. Um, but in particular, you know, ferrets construct. Uh, uh, arrangements of grains and they carry them to the surface. And these arrangements of grains can be quite large. There is a limitation on that size because you've got to get it through the tunnel so the grain, the grain um, arrangement can't be bigger than the cross-sectional diameter of the tunnel. Um, uh, and so there's some interesting interplay between uh, 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 the size of grains and um, uh, uh, the manipulation of those uh, grain balls. Um, the next thing we looked at was uh, traffic control. And so looking at how um, individuals um, move through tunnels collectively, right? So you're living kind of in this um, collective environment where you have to uh, get around each other. Um, this happens, you know, in natural tunnels, uh, typically in pure darkness, right? So you don't know whether there's a, a jam ahead of you or not. Um, the other thing that, uh, that we found um, was that there is a sort of traffic flow, um, uh, a rate um, associated with tunnel diameters. So larger tunnel diameters had less propensity to form uh, traffic clogs, um, but, you know, most interestingly, uh, the ants sort of through, through behavior um, uh, frustrate themselves, if you will, uh, cause traffic jams maybe unnecessarily um, because of this uh, need to stop and interact with each other, right? So there's no real sort of long distance communication aside from just a general alarm pheromone type um, uh, behavior that ants have. Instead, when they're in the nest environment, uh, typically when they reach another ant, they stop and they, they wiggle their antennae, they ante antennae. And that intonation process takes a certain amount of time. That, that intonation process causes two ants to stop in a tunnel. And so irrespective of how big a tunnel might be, you still see the formation of these, these jams just because uh, there's a group of ants who are stopping and interacting with each other and another group of ants coming in uh, who will also stop and interact with that group. Um, so interestingly, you know, even if you have quite large tunnels, because of the process of kind of trail formation and the process of stopping and interacting, you still have these fundamental limits on the rate uh, of ant flow within tunnels. Um, and because my talk uh, blew up to about 80 slides, I'm not going to go into that, uh, but I'm happy to talk with anybody about the sort of traffic flow dynamics that we see within ants uh, later on as well. 
Um, but what I wanted to talk about more in depth now is um, the aspects of locomotion within these tunnels. Um, you know, I'm particularly interested in uh, locomotion in which animals are sort of challenged from a, um, a mechanical and sensory perspective of moving quickly through environments that have um, some sort of complexity to them, substrate complexity uh, for insect flight, maybe some three-dimensional complexity. Um, and I think tunnels present one of the most challenging environments that um, an animal can move through, right? They're moving through an environment that has uh, incredibly rough ground. Uh, they're moving through it, uh, potentially climbing vertically. Uh, they're moving in pure darkness, so with no sort of um, visual feedback uh, in these environments. Um, and so what do they do? And so we wanted to study this. Uh, we studied it by performing high-speed video experiments, looking at um, animals, uh, uh, individuals moving vertically within uh, tunnels. Um, and this is you know, a sort of prototypical or, or standard um, uh, descending climb of an ant. And what you'll see is that I'm just plotting out the Y position here um, and the tilt of the body. But what you kind of notice is that when I slow this down, you can see two pretty clear slip and fall events, OK? And you know that may seem sort of um, innocent, um, but I found it really interesting that that one you know just a casual observation of these ants moving up and down tunnels, um, casual as in you know you come into the lab and you take a look. What you'll see is that they slip and fall all the time. Okay, so um, moving movement up and down these tunnels is not this process of um, necessarily this process of um, precise placement of limbs so that you can generate all the required forces so that you don't slip and fall. Um, it potentially is a more haphazard, uh, I'm putting my limbs where I think they need to be. If they don't hit the right spot, I might slip and fall. But as we saw here in the case of this particular tunnel, when they slipped and fell, uh, you know, nothing detrimental happened. Um, but that seems to be related to the size of the tunnel that the ants are moving through. Um, so we wanted to test this and, and ask this question of how does the size of a tunnel that these ants create affect their locomotion capabilities um, just from an individual perspective? And so we did an experiment. Hold on. This thing keeps jumping ahead. Um, where we uh, basically set up a foraging arena um, and we set up a nest. Um, the other thing I love about working with ants is that they're a fantastic uh, species to work with in, in the lab. You can basically get them to do whatever you want. You pull a colony with a queen, you put them in a, a nest environment, you put food and uh, sort of a foraging arena with water uh, somewhere else, you put between those two sources whatever your experimental uh, protocol is going to be and you get ants freely moving between those two things. Um, and you know, with some care and experimental setup, uh, you can collect a lot of data and you can, you can do very care careful manipulations of them. So this manipulation was um, looking at uh, the, the sort of selectivity of moving through different sized tunnels, uh, the ability to move at different speeds within different sized tunnels, um, and the propensity to um, not slip and fall or to arrest one's um, sort of um, haphazard locomotion within different tunnel sizes. And you know, to, to make a long story short, one of the first things that we saw that I thought was really interesting was that we still see lots of slips and falls. Okay, so these ants are now moving through, uh, you know, glass tunnels, uh, glass glass um, tubes, uh, smooth surfaces. Ants have um, these viscous adhesive pads on their feet, so they can climb vertically and inverted on these um, uh, on these smooth surfaces. Yet they still slip and fall. All right, and it happens naturally. Uh, we're not inducing anything here. It's just a sort of um, you know again casual observation of ants slipping and falling. These are high speed videos slowed down. Um, and one of the cool things I think um, that we found from this was that um, I'm just highlighting two of these sort of same behaviors here. When they're slipping and falling head first, um, you note that the antennae are the, the two appendages that are hitting the wall first and seem to be the things that are pitching them into the opposing wall and, and sort of enabling this um, recovery process. Um, and I think that this, uh, along with the observation of these ants using antennae um, to construct uh, it, grains, uh, grain assemblies for, for load carriage, seem to suggest to me that you know, antennae are um, far more than just these sort of sensitive sensory appendages. Um, they seem to, to have more mechanical tasks um, to be used uh, in a sense of you know, uh, supporting your whole body weight to catch yourself as you're falling, um, to manipulate objects, things like that. Um, and that's something that hadn't been reported in the literature, which um, I think is really, really interesting. Um, beyond that, we wanted to 
now look at the sensitivity of um, how a tunnel size affects an individual's ability to recover from a slip and fall. Okay, so again, you're moving through tunnels, you're moving in darkness uh, at high speed, potentially at high speed, um, slipping and falling. So how does the size of a tunnel affect that? We induce slips and falls uh, uh, through a vertical perturbation, so putting these tunnels now on a um, short uh, uh, displacement stage that just moved at a relatively high acceleration. Um, it says no ants were harmed in this experiment. I don't know if that's entirely true. Ants might have been harmed in this experiment. Um, and the experiment looked like this, right? So this is uh, you know in real time, basically. So we're just knocking them from the wall, totally unphysical. I'm not simulating earthquakes. I'm, I'm you know, basically just saying in the most extreme case what happens when you're kicked from uh, the surface of the tunnel. Um, and the result that I'm going to show you is one that I think everybody could have guessed ahead of time, right? So why did we do this experiment? Um, what you see is that uh, if I normalize the tunnel diameter by the ant's body length, what you see is that for small enough tunnel diameters here, we see that you basically stop your fall. You don't fall all the way to the bottom of the tunnel at 100% success rate. As that uh, tunnel diameter is, becomes larger and maybe becomes approximately two times your body length, you basically always fall to the bottom of the surface, okay? So um, at some level, not that surprising, right? You, you basically are able to arrest a fall if you catch yourself um, uh, in a tunnel or if you fall in a tunnel that uh, enables some element of your body to span the whole tum tunnel diameter. Right, and I think that's something that uh, you know, we all could have potentially guessed. Um, we do the experiment, we, we see that that tends to be the case. Um, but we were interested in, in understanding uh, what the, you know, how this might relate to the size of tunnels that these ants preferentially create um, in their natural nests. And so to do this, we performed uh, x-ray um, computed tomography experiments on uh, actual uh, constructed tunnels within, you know, freshly wetted, uh, nice um, monodispersed grains of, um, of glass. Uh, and we allowed the ants to construct these tunnels for, um, I believe in this case it was 48 hours. Uh, and then we put them in a CT scanner and we measured the tunnel diameter. You see something like this. So, you know, they create these vertical tunnels. Vertical tunnels then create these lateral offshoots. Um, the tunnel diameter does increase over time. Um, and uh, uh, the tunnel diameter um, in these cases, when they're initially creating tunnels, we think is the, the you know, sort of this trade-off between being able to uh, put, squeeze yourself into the tunnel, uh, but also uh, to excavate at speed, so without the expense of um, excavating wider tunnels. And what we found is that the size of the tunnel diameter was relatively um, consistent across um, uh, numerous different um, uh, replicates of this experiment. So you basically uh, repeat the experiment with many, many different colonies. Um, and what we find also is that the tunnel diameter that they tend to prefer to create um, is also at this sort of approximate body length um, uh, diameter. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think maybe uh, sort of walking way out on a plank right now by showing these two plots uh, uh, next to each other. Uh, I'm not necessarily arguing that ants are constructing tunnels that enable them to arrest slips and falls, but what I do think is interesting is that they're constructing tunnels that I think are conducive to their own locomotion, okay? So, um, you know, because we're all friends, I'll sort of give my analogy um, that, you know, when we construct steps, we construct steps that are, are related to our typical body size and our typical step length, right? Uh, it's uncomfortable for me to walk up a, um, you know, a pavilion where you would be sitting on it and the step height would be two and a half times a typical step, right? So we construct locomotor environments that are conducive or that are related to our body morphology, and I think that ants are doing the exact same thing, not necessarily because of slips and falls, but also uh, maybe because of just the preferential arrangement of limbs as they're um, climbing up these surfaces or down these surfaces. Um, so what we're trying to um, draw is this connection between uh, the sort of ability to shape an environment towards your own morphology, uh, which may enable different sort of um, locomotion functionalities, um, which I think is particularly interesting, um, and I'm interested in sort of um, continuing on in the, in the work that I do. Um, one of the other things we noted was that the posture during climbing um, changed. So, you know, ants are, are moving uh, in the experiment, moving through tunnels that are um, up to three times their body length in, in diameter, um, and all the way as small as about half their body length in diameter. And what we see is that um, the typical posture that they prefer when they're climbing um, in tunnels uh, is this sprawled mid-limb posture, so keeping the limbs, the mid-limbs um, as sprawled out as possible. And that mid-limb sprawl posture or, or length is about a body length, um, just to give you some perspective. So, you know, they're basically, their body length um, 
just in a horizontal distance. And so um, if you look at the mid-limb distance now uh, as a function of tunnel diameter, what you see is that um, as the uh, an animals become more and more cramped, as the um, tunnel diameter becomes um, uh, smaller with respect to their body size, what you see is that basically they become more cramped. Um, and we just quantified this, this sort of posture of their limbs in this cramped climbing behavior um, just by characterizing whether the mid limbs were uh, arranged so that they were uh, pointed towards the frontal direction or if they're pointed back. Um, and so we call this basically a sprawled or confined um, uh, posture. The confined posture being with the mid limb pointed backwards, sprawled being um, sort of able to sprawl their limbs out. Um, what you see is that uh, in these smaller tunnels, basically they always preferentially are using this, um, this posture where the mid limbs are pointed in the backwards direction. Um, and this, this gets at another aspect of ant locomotion that or in particular I'll say uh, insects that I find fascinating, which is that you know, they have these incredibly complex limbs, um, these limbs that have spiny hairs uh, distributed along the length of the limb. Um, they've got these uh, tarsal claws, uh, a um, adhesive pad at the end, um, spines throughout uh, the limb. And so when they're climbing in this more sprawled posture condition, um, you know, these, these claws and this uh, adhesive pad can engage the surface. They can um, generate all the traction that they need. Um, when they're climbing in this more confined posture, they're able to use the spines, um, these, these um, spines that are distally pointed away from their body, um, to engage the surface and climb um, and generate traction forces via those, uh, those spiny hairs. Um, and we've seen this before in uh, a study of, of cockroaches moving across uh, wire meshes, um, where the similar spiny hairs that are distributed along the lengths of these cockroach legs are able to engage these uh, mesh surfaces, uh, enable them to move at basically um, the same speed, pretty close to the same speed um, as they do on flat ground. Um, and so, you know, I think that one um, takeaway for, for me uh, is this idea that um, uh, the legs and the appendages of insects are highly multifunctional. Um, you have the ability of antennae to act as uh, mechanical, um, mechanical uh, appendages. Um, you have the ability of um, these uh, distributed spines and these um, sort of multifunctional um, uh, tarsi with claws and adhesive pads to engage all sorts of different surfaces um, to contend with whatever sort of complex environment they might be dealing with. Um, and so, you know, um, this brief look at subtraining locomotion, you know, I really focused on uh, the, the tasks of individuals moving through these subtraining environments and how this relationship between the size of the environment that they create is related to body morphology, potentially for locomotor purposes. Um, but also I think that there's sort of interesting examples, again, like I said, of just um, the different mechanical uses of these appendages. Any questions on any of this work so far? David, yeah. Is there some kind of negative feedback when the tunnels get too wide? You said that maybe ants are not trying to build that size, but maybe just naturally ride like it. I mean, I think that that's a good point, right? So uh, that, that's where I said I sort of was walking out a very long plank and somebody could have sawed it off on me like David right here. Um, because I think that trying to say that uh, this, this size of the vertical tunnel that they're making is explicitly for um, individual locomotion, um, it, I mean, that can't be true because the plaster cast of the first nest that I showed you, I mean, that's a nest that was probably um, three or four years old. Uh, the vertical tunnels in the center of that are about three to four times larger than the, the tunnel, preferential tunnel size that I showed you, right? So the creation of these, um, uh, these sort of um, initial tunnels for a nest are, I think the trade-off there is uh, try and get as deep as you can as quickly as you can. And it's not necessarily, you know, do that with some excess safe, safety factors so I don't slip and fall. I mean, the other thing we should note about insects is that, I mean, they can slip and fall all they want, nothing's gonna happen, right? So you can throw them off a, um, a building and they're gonna be fine. So what does slipping and falling really mean? Um, and, and that's where I think that, um, again, you know, a caveat to this notion of uh, uh, movement through these tunnels of their exact body length in diameter isn't necessarily to um, inhibit slips and falls. I think it may also be just to um, uh, give them the best possible ability to engage surfaces with all of their limbs across um, the different uh, sides of the tunnel. So the main tunnel is much wider. Yes, they, yeah, yeah. They more traffic. Yes, and I mean, I think the other thing that I note is that um, in the, the foraging tunnels that are horizontal, right, 
slipping and falling isn't an issue. And those tunnels, certainly the tunnel diameter gets larger as you get closer to the central nest, kind of much like a river system. Uh, you know, you have basically the, the most distally um, uh, arranged tunnels are the smallest, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger in diameter as you get towards the center of the nest. Yeah, go ahead. What, what happens in terms of information transfer when two ants meet and I mean, I should ask you that. I think uh, <laughs> I no, I um, I don't. Um, I think that uh, you know what they're doing, as far as I understand, is basically there's waxy um, uh, cuticle, um, and they're you know sensing whether uh, it's friend or foe. Um, you know whether you're um, one of my kin or if you're a neighboring fire ant colony. Again, these you know they live in high they high. Live in neighboring fire ant colonies don't seem to well, that's true. I mean, so, you know, you've got monogyne and polygyne, right? So multi-queen and single-queen uh, fire ant colonies. And so these sort of multi-queen fire ant colonies, I don't quite know their, the distribution of them. Uh, 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 but yes, okay. no. So I, I also don't know. So, yeah, go ahead. Why are, why are they walking in a regime where they fall so much? Like, I mean, they fall so much that they don't get to see the fall? I mean, I think that's a good question. Um, I I think it could be a matter of um, who cares about falling, right? So why why take the time and effort to place your feet so that you can exactly, um, you know, balance your inertial acceleration by all the forces you can generate with the ground. Maybe slipping and falling is just a, you know, it's a feature of moving in these subterranean environments where you have surfaces all around you that you can catch yourself and, and you know, arrest your fall. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that in these experiments, um, you know, some of them are, are triggering an alarm. Some of them are just, uh, they're just doing their normal behavior, right? So the slips and falls in the glass tunnels that I show are just, they slip and fall. It could be a smooth substrate. Um, in these tunnels here, um, I think in these particular experiments, I was inducing some, some high, higher speed movement. But even then, um, you know, the speeds that I saw were not that different from just their typical up-down um, speeds. So I, I think that, I think that as we start to look closer, and this will this will feed well into the next part of the talk. I think as we start to look closer, um, limb placement error and um, slips and falls, I think, are a very common feature of insect locomotion um, in in realistic environments. Right, not a smooth glass microscope um, slide, um, and I I think that it's just not a, it's not detrimental. So um, maybe maybe there's no need to build in all that extra complexity of, of motor control. And I. Can you sorry? Can you? Um, um, within a tunnel or just in general? Um, and you're talking about speed or or? You know, I haven't. Uh, I haven't. I've worked with basically two species, so from my own um, experience, you know, the typical speeds are around 10 to 20 body lengths per second. So um, uh, across, you know, the, the size variation of speed that I show in my initial slide, I don't know quite how that varies. Working for human, it's like the square root of the gravity times the length of the leg. So uh, it's like the square root of the gravity times the length of the leg. So Sure, you're, you're thinking. Right, right. So you're talking about fruit number and, and you know relationship of kind of inverted pendulum models of, of uh, legged locomotion. Um, I you know I haven't done much analysis in that in that sense. Um, I also think um, I think we're going to hear maybe we'll hear some of that on on Sunday. Uh, I'm sorry on uh, Friday, but um, I think that applying those kind of models to um, small scale hexapods is also I think. Uh, well, I think it's an interesting area of research right now. I think that um, it's it's not necessarily clear whether inverted pendulum models or spring-loaded inverted pendulum models are appropriate for these small-scale um, animals as well. Um, and I'm, I think, happy to have many discussions about that while we're here. Um, let me move on. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Do they have any gait? Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry I didn't maybe give a, a more primer on um, on ant locomotion. So ants typically walk with an alternating tripod gait. So um, 
two, four, and hind limb, mid limb on the imposing side, and they just basically alternate between those. Um, their step frequencies, well, we'll see a, a sort of more clear example of just horizontal locomotion in the next um, part of the talk, um, but uh, uh, alternating tripod um, gait, and that's a typical fast, fast-ish gait for most hexapods as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's hard to analyze the, the whether it's explicitly alternating tripod in this tunnel right here. In the smooth glass slides, yes. Um, so we've done that. Um, and and uh, they're sort of doing this alternating tripod gait. Their antennae are, I mean, don't appear to be really correlated with their sort of stepping patterns, although that's something that I'm really interested in. You know, ants are using basically their antennae as the only real um, sensor of what's coming up ahead of them, um, particularly in underground environments where they don't have vision, right? And so um, whether their antennae are used to inform the placement of their footsteps, I think that's something that is really interesting that I, I want to keep working with. We don't know. Um, but I'll show you some, oh, no, go ahead. Totally. So um, in horizontal tunnels, uh, in, in natural nests, there's a large variation of tunnel size as well. And again, it's sort of um, smallest at the furthest away from the center of the nest, larger as you get closer to the nest. Um, it's uh, larger and more, more oval in the horizontal tunnels, right? So instead of just being circular, you get now these more oval shaped tunnels, as you might expect, just to maximize the kind of floor space area. Um, and we did do a number of traffic studies. I have, you know, I can talk about that. I'm happy to uh, after. You know, I was expecting to see some, I was expecting to see, or I hypothesized that, that we would see some preference for the larger tunnels. We didn't really see any preference. We didn't see any preference in terms of um, the number of ants that were going up and down each tunnel. Um, uh, and again, I think that's related to some of this traffic work where you find that even in the largest tunnels, you still experience what we call you know, traffic jams because they're, it, it's this necessary process of stopping and interacting with each other, right? Even in, you know, if you want to think about uh, the ground as a sort of infinite diameter tunnel, uh, they're still basically walking along these paths that are defined by pheromone trails, and so they're still always running into each other and always clogging up. Um, and so the, the tunnel diameter does come into a play eventually, uh, but I think that uh, before that, you've got all this sort of behavior of just stopping and interacting that's causing problems for them. But it's also necessary, so I think it's sort of this trade-off. Um, I'm happy to take all these, you know, or continue these discussions um, after as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about um, uh, sort of moving above ground and looking at locomotion on rough grounds. Um, okay, so in particular, um, this is work that uh, my postdoc has been doing, um, uh, looking at how does substrate roughness affect speed. So, you know, the the answer found in almost um, uh, every continent. They uh, live in all sorts of different uh, substrate types. Uh, they live in trees, they live on the ground, underground. Um, and we're interested in understanding basically how the complexity of these substrate environments um, uh, affect locomotion. Um, and a number of people have done work in this area. Um, so I'll note that you know I'm not the first person to, to think about this. Um, and um, folks have looked at uh, ants forming trails um, in the presence of a smooth ground uh, and a uh, sort of more challenging ground. And they tend to form these um, trails that uh, minimize the total time it takes to get from point A to point B um, when you know, they're sort of uh, in the presence of a substrate that's going to slow them down. People have looked at the, um, the effect of tree bark roughness uh, on arboreal ants. Um, uh, Jerome has looked at uh, and been looking at for a while um, locomotion on granular substrates. Um, and we're going to hear from him a little bit later today, uh, not necessarily on this topic, I think. Um, and so, you know, people have been thinking about this for a while, how substrate roughness affects um, uh, legged locomotion. Um, and we wanted to, um, you know, sort of attack this from a large scale perspective, just how are, animal, or how are these ants um, affected in terms of sort of macroscopic speed and things like that. But we also then wanted to understand uh, more, more specifically what's happening at the um, foot placement air perspective, you know, how are individual feet um, affected by uh, uh, roughness substrates, different roughness substrates. So we did an experiment where uh, we took in Argentine uh, ants into the lab. So we don't have, we do have fire ants in um, San Diego. They're a different 
species, not Solenopsis invicta, um, but more prevalently we have Argentine ants um, who are basically, they live in these super colonies, they're incredibly easy to find, you just step outside, uh, you can dig up a colony, bring them into the lab, set up another one of these experiments where you have a colony separated by some uh, substrate that you might want to look at their locomotion uh, abilities on, and then a foraging arena where you place food and water. Set up a nice um, trail going back and forth. Use cameras to uh, image them as they're walking across these substrates. Um, and we used basically three different types of substrates and then one flat substrate. We 3D printed checkerboards. Um, we chose this as um, a substrate that had a single length scale. So it was one millimeter in height, but then the length scale in the horizontal direction was uh, one by one, three by three, or five by five. Um, we then monitored them moving across these substrates. We did this for, um, I believe, 10 colonies. Um, again, I don't quite remember the exact number. Um, we did this for about 11,000 ants. Um, and we recorded about 200 frames per second. So we can get out um, uh, very uh, nice information about uh, the whole body movement as well as where their individual limbs are, are being placed across these substrates. Um, first thing that you see is that you know ants establish these pheromone trails. Um, so just on all the different substrates, you see pretty nice um, sort of uh, distributed paths that are that are localized around a single pheromone trail. Um, no real clear uh, pattern uh, or difference of pattern of these pheromone trails across the different substrates. Um, I think kind of interestingly, and again because we're all friends here, uh, you know you tend to see that there does seem to be some sort of cross cutting of the five millimeter length scale. I can say that the five mill millimeter length scale is about the size of these voids here. Um, so they do maybe do some edge following as they're on these larger substrates. Uh, we measure velocity across um, these substrates of the individuals. Uh, we then take as a measure of this sort of um, uh, velocity of a trail, uh, we take the median value of that, we aggregate that, and we measure basically the um, median speed uh, of all individuals across these different substrates. And so what you see is that basically um, these ants are walking at about 15 millimeters per second on flat ground, you know, with a rel relatively wide distribution in terms of their um, top speed. Um, now again, this is sort of the, the speed, an individual point uh, in this distribution is an aggregate measure of a trackway, so an individual walking across the full substrate. We turn that into one measurement of the median speed of that, uh, that uh, uh, path. We then aggregate that into these distributions. So what you see is that uh, on the one millimeter substrate, the speed is, it's not quite halved, but it's um, at about, uh, I would say, eight millimeters per second. And then you see a subtle rise in speed um, as the substrate gets coarser and coarser. So again, flat, one, three, and five millimeter uh, in, in horizontal spatial scale. So, you know, first observation, which mimics what other people have observed, roughness does affect uh, individual walking speeds. Um, we see that uh, there's a specific length scale dependent um, effect on this walking speed. And so the next question that you can ask is, um, is this a, a speed limit in effect or is it a result of behavior? Are the ants just um, slowing down because the substrate is foreign to them because, you know, for whatever reason. Um, we attempted to test this by basically inducing a more um, alarmed state. Um, and so you can do this by basically uh, pumping in a little bit of cinnamon infused air. So, you know, you go out um, during Christmas time and you find like some cinnamon potpourri, uh, you put it in a, uh, a solenoid and then you just uh, allow it to uh, be pulsed into the uh, tunnel. You do it once every hour. You can then get a before and after perturbation uh, speed. And we attempted to measure the top speed. Okay, so before we're looking at kind of the median of that distribution, now I'm gonna look at the um, cutoff for the upper 95% of the walking speeds. And I'm gonna look at a before perturbation, which is the circle, and an after perturbation, which is this line here. Okay, so what you see is that the, the sort of peak speed that they're walking at um, basically is relatively slower um, on flat than when they're stimulated. Okay, so there's this increase in speed. We apply the cinnamon perturbation, they increase their speed on flat ground. Same thing happens on five, to a lesser extent on three, and to the, to the least extent on one. So it looks like the top speeds on these one millimeter substrates are pretty much not behaviorally mod modulated. Uh, they're, they're controlled by just the, the ability of the ants to walk across these, uh, these one millimeter substrates. Um, we also wanted to ask the question, uh, is this 
ecolo ecologically relevant whatsoever. So, uh, you know, we're collaborating with um, an ecologist who's very interested in uh, Argentine ant dispersion. Uh, you know, where do we find them? How do we stop them from getting there? Um, and so we did uh, field tests at the UC San Diego um, field station where we put out the same substrate. We allowed the animals to um, establish pheromone trails to a food, food source, giving the choice of rough substrate or flat substrate, um, but also giving them these three different options or three different uh, uh, trails. So one, three, and five versus flat. And we could test the, um, uh, the effect of uh, where we find a pheromone trail being established or a foraging trail being established um, versus flat ground. And so uh, in the case of the one millimeter substrate, what we find is that there is a highly significant preference for walking on flat ground, okay? So about 75% of the time, ants uh, establish a trail on uh, the flat ground substrate. As you look at the three millimeter, you see that uh, there's also a significant effect, um, but there's a slightly wider, wider variation. On the five millimeter, no significant effect. So we found uh, pheromone trails equally on flat substrates as on the five millimeter substrate, okay? And this seems to match again our observation that you know, the most affected uh, or effective substrate at inhibiting walking is this, this sort of one millimeter substrate, which again, you know, presents them with the most, um, uh, the most perturbations per unit distance anyways, so maybe that's, that's exactly what we'd expect. We wanted to take this a little bit further and ask, um, you know, underlying these speed changes, what's going on at the limb level? So, you know, are they um, changing their gait? Are they using their limbs in different ways? Um, and it just so happened about a year and a half ago, uh, uh, this open source deep learning um, package was uh, um, put up on BioArchive um, to uh, uh, enable um, sort of automated tracking of um, animal um, sort of skeletons, uh, jointed uh, models of animals um, in an automated fence, uh, uh, sense using this deep learning uh, toolkit. Uh, there's now a number of these deep learning toolkits for doing this automated tracking. Um, Leap in particular was nice because it's specifically set up for um, observing animals in this dorsal um, uh, 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 field of view, um, so you can use some of the symmetry properties of the animal from that perspective. Um, so we built up a um, deep learning model. We applied it to um, locomotion on these flat substrates. See, it works incredibly well. Um, this Leap uh, a, a toolkit we just trained on the um, antennae and the, uh, the distal ends of the feet. So we weren't tracking every joint, we were just focusing on where the feet are placed and what the velocities of the feet are. Um, LEAP gives you an estimate of the confidence of the, um, of the uh, uh, measurement, so you can do some, some sort of uh, data cleaning and things like that. Um, as well as working well on the flat substrate, we were a little um, scared of running it on the rough substrate, but it worked relatively well as well. Um, and here you can see, you know, sort of our first glimpse of what's potentially different about locomotion on these rough substrates. Um, I mean, you can see it's slower. It looks, again, uh, less rhythmic, uh, for, for lack of a better word. Um, and there seems to be maybe more, more error in foot placement. Um, we looked at the first sort of measurement that people typically do with um, legged locomotion, so kind of a fundamental kinematic relationship, uh, the relationship of speed versus stride frequency. I'm sorry if this is, uh, the font is small, but this is the average um, speed of an individual stride, right? So from touchdown of one limb to the sequential touchdown of, of that same limb, um, and what the frequency that they're walking at is. This is flat, one, three, and five. Um, and again, the sort of fundamental relationship here for um, bipedal, even alternating tripod um, uh, hexapods is that you see a nice linear relationship uh, when you have a constant stride length. So uh, modulation of speed through changing your stride frequency, either speeding up or slowing down your, your stepping pattern, but keeping the same um, uh, touchdown location of your, your limbs will give you this kind of behavior. And we see it's basically the same for all of these different substrates. Um, uh, and I say basically the same by drawing these lines. We actually built uh, a model to predict uh, the walking speed based on this constant length model. Um, and we found um, a good agreement between uh, a majority of the data set for the rough ground, so for the rough ground here. Um, but this, this model allowed us to classify whether um, there was sort of an inlier or outlier, whether this constant length model described the velocity that we observed on these rough substrates well or not. Um, and what we found was that um, when you build this model and you look at the number of points that um, are not well predicted, they lie outside of, say, five standard deviations of this model prediction, what you find is that this one millimeter substrate had the most number of um, uh, outliers. And I'm going to call those uh, maybe disrupted strides. So strides that don't fall along this sort of simple, constant length, kinematic um, uh, walking behavior um, uh, pattern. Um, so again, 
kind of echoing what we've seen in the velocity results, one millimeter seems to be the worst in that many of those strides, about 20% of them or a little bit over, uh, what was that, oh, I'm sorry, close to 15% of them uh, lie off of this um, constant stride length um, uh, uh, pattern. You can see this as well as if you me measure the um, stride to stride distance that an individual stride takes. So kind of like um, uh, what's called a return map, looking at a periodic behavior and measuring the uh, relationship between the n and the n plus, plus one value of that uh, um, uh, measure. So the measure we chose was the length distance of a stride. And what you see again is that on flat ground, if, if points lay along the 45 degree, you have a nice rhythmic behavior. behavior. It repeats itself, repeats itself, repeats itself. Um, but we see this cluster of points. I could turn the lights off to maybe show this better. But um, this cluster of points that fall outside of this, that fall short. So there are these inhibited steps. They're, they tend to be shorter than uh, the, the preferred stride length. And again, you measure the uh, propensity of those points to lie outside of this, um, this sort of repeated walking pattern, this sort of undisrupted walking pattern. And again, we see that this one millimeter seems to inhibit them the most. Um, we can do other things. We can measure the uh, propensity to, or the, the sort of um, foot touchdown error. Um, so we measure the foot touchdown error uh, of, of these sort of um, uh, uh, inlier points, points that are undisrupted. And you see, you know, basically that there is variation in the touchdown locations. The gray is the convex hull of all touchdowns. The um, ellipse is basically the uh, characterizing one standard deviation of the touchdown locations. Um, but if you look at the outlier points, you see that there's um, quite a bit more foot touchdown error. Um, and you know what's kind of hard to, to maybe see from this blast of figures, I'm sorry, is that uh, all of the foot touchdown errors are shorter than the typical touchdown error. Okay. Uh, and that can happen from a number of reasons that I'll detail in a second. Um, but the point is that the foot touchdown error is larger on these outlier strides. Um, and we can show that even more clearly by basically just building a, um, a simple predictive model that says, uh, you know, what is the relationship between the amount of touchdown error from the preferred touchdown location and the likelihood that a point doesn't lie along this nice kinematic walking pattern uh, line, which are all of these gray points. What you see is that logistic regressions um, explain this, uh, this relationship relatively nicely. Um, and there are confidence intervals within here. So they, they explain these um, relationships quite nicely. Um, and you know, it sort of makes sense from a, from a um, uh, you know, from, I don't know, what we might expect perspective that the larger the foot error, the, the larger that that's going to be, larger likelihood that that's going to be associated with some sort of temporal disrupt disruption of touchdowns. OK, so basically what we're finding is that these one millimeter substrate, substrates um, seem to induce the most foot error in terms of placement of touchdowns. Um, and that foot error is associated with some kind of disruption of the temporal walking pattern, uh, which there's a cause and effect thing that we don't necessarily, can't necessarily explain, um, tends to cause them to walk at slower speeds. The slower speeds, though, that you see, the dominant, you know, behavior is they're still walking like they're walking on flat ground. They're just walking at slower frequencies. So you know, all this could have been explained by me just saying one millimeter substrates, they walk with slower fre stride frequencies. The question is, is that happening because as they go to higher frequencies, they see or experience more foot error, which then causes these temporal disruptions, which causes them to slow back down? Or is it just a already uh, a sort of um, uh, you know, modulation of their stride frequency uh, because of the, the um, uh, substrate itself? Uh, so let me ask this or address this question now. What is an outlier? So what does one of these disrupted um, strides look like? I'm going to turn the lights off just to see. Nope. Nope. All the ones that I didn't want. Well, that's fine. OK, maybe we can see better. But So what I'm showing now are just uh, you know, a selection of these, these quote unquote um, disrupted strides, strides that uh, had a large touchdown error in terms of uh, foot location um, and that were associated, like I said, with these sort of temporal disruptions. And what I want you to notice, because um, it is subtle, is that I'm highlighting a limb here. Red is when it's touchdown. When it goes back to white, that's the end of that quote unquote stride. What you'll see in all of these cases is that these are instances where a limb is being put forward and hitting an obstacle ahead of when it would have um, preferred to uh, a touchdown at its preferred touchdown location. Okay, So we're seeing instances where these limbs are basically moving forward, hitting an obstacle, pausing for a second, slowing down. Our you know, algorithm of, of measuring touchdown location is based off foot velocity. When the foot velocity goes to zero, you, you measure that as a touchdown. Um, and we see these instances, again, where a foot is moving forward, hits an obstacle, and then gets to the preferred location. So moving forward 
starting now, hits an obstacle, and then is potentially repositioned. And you know, whether this is uh, stopping because behaviorally they stop their limb and then they reposition, or stopping because mechanically they, they can't move their limb past that uh, obstacle uh, based off the force that they're generating from the muscle, we don't know. Um, but what we're seeing is that one millimeter substrates are inducing the most of these types of behaviors where limbs are um, uh, haphazardly, I'll say, hitting um, obstacles during the swing phase and either being repositioned purposefully or just getting to the end location based off of just the compliance of the limb and the springiness and just moving your limb through that collision. So we see these kind of inadvertent limb collisions which we think are um, the root cause of uh, most of this, this um, uh, behavior of, of foot error, uh, foot placement error, which we also think is the root cause of these um, speed reductions. And so, you know, the conclusion of this is that we think ants are using these similar limb kinematics um, on different roughs, roughness substrates, but they are um, experiencing larger and larger foot error, touchdown error, um, on these different substrates. Um, and that's the sort of um, uh, what's explaining the um, uh, speed change on these uh, one millimeter substrates is this sort of foot touchdown error. Um, okay. I'm going to blast through this very, very quickly. What I really just want to show is that basically uh, there's lots of inspiration now that, uh, that insects have been providing for roboticists, uh, particularly in the areas of uh, mechanisms, control, uh, navigation, um, and collective behavior. And you know, in my lab, we're um, you know actively working on building mechanisms uh, and building new types of, of uh, robots, uh, specifically new types of fabrication methods for robots um, that are inspired by the insect exoskeleton. You're right, and I'm just fascinated by uh, insect behavior, but also by just the mechanical properties of the uh, the way that they're built. So um, I think exoskeletons are incredibly interesting. They're continuum of um, stiff and flexible materials uh, integrated together, uh, with interesting sort of underactuation properties, um, passive mechanics that enable locomotion, um, and, and fascinating sort of nonlinear mechanisms. There's kind of two, two ways in which we, we do this in my lab. One is, is a very expensive, fancy way of making these insect scale robotics um, that was really pioneered um, at Harvard by my postdoc advisor, Rob Wood. Uh, you know, you use a laser, you cut out um, uh, these precise patterns in rigid and flexural material. You arrange them in such a way so that when you stack them together, you can make uh, mechanisms. These mechanisms can be things like um, transmissions that can turn one motion into another motion, and you can build robot legs uh, and robot hinges. Um, you can build these at very small scales and sort of try to approach the, um, the, the sort of small scale of um, um, uh, insects. And we can study locomotion properties of these small scale systems. Um, the other uh, way that you know, we're sort of trying to, to make these insect-inspired robots, um, which I think is also incredibly fascinating, is a much more low-cost version. Um, so basically, we're, we're, uh, we've developed, um, I'll say invented, this method of uh, 3D printing with a traditional 3D printer onto heated thermoplastic films. Okay, um, and this is something that you know I, I really just want to get through because I think it is incredibly accessible and anybody can do it if you have uh, one of the even you know cheapest of cheaper cheapest um, 3D printers uh, off of Amazon. Just need a heated bed. You need to be able to buy some thermoplastic. Again, thermoplastic is uh, incredibly easy to, to find. You heat it up to a certain temperature and you 3D print on it and you can make these very flexible structures which typically 3D printing flexible materials requires either multiple materials, uh, it requires um, sort of poor choice of material um, and very expensive printers. Um, so we've characterized this process. We can get good adhesion between these um, uh, films. We can control the stiffness of these elements. And I'm sorry I'm going so fast. I feel I'm, I'm a little late. Um, and we can make structures that are something like this. So basically, these very simple structures that have mechanical functionality programmed into them, so um, say, hinge components that jam so that we can actuate two hinges with a single tendon. Um, we can build uh, these jamming elements that can jam in different directions. Uh, we can build these highly flexible limbs. Um, these flexible limbs can have, you know, maybe um, uh, jamming elements that jam in flexion, that jam in um, extension, and that also exhibit sort of torque reversal mechanisms. So with a single tendon, you can actuate very complicated motions. Um, and all of this, again, is done uh, using very low cost 3D printing um, techniques. Happy to talk with anybody after uh, about that as well. 
So again, my mini, mini conclusion of this is um, I think that uh, insects provide a wonderful um, uh, uh, insight into mechanical design of these kinds of um, interesting structures. Um, and my overall conclusion is that I'm you know, happy to talk with anybody for the next uh, 72 hours about uh, why ants are awesome and uh, what we can learn about them. So thank you. <laughs>